knows? My guess is that once people, you know, if the world did start to do it and there weren't any obvious bad effects, probably it would become more of a normalized part of climate policy and less of a high profile thing. It would just become part of the woodwork. I'm quite serious when I say what we need to do is to have a much broader research program with many more people in it to try and break some of the groupthink. And I truly don't have a strong opinion about what the right answer is. Okay. Uh, so, in terms of solid, so first of all, I, I don't think, I mean, solid particles are, I think, a thing really worth exploring because it looks like they could produce some uh, better results with less risk. Yeah. But does that mean that I would discount marine cloud brightening? No, I take that seriously too. And uh, among solid particles, we've spent almost no effort right now being serious about optimizing. What we try to do is at least for the first time think hard about how solid particles would interact with the real background stratosphere. And, and to, you know, the one thing I think I've done the last little while is try and get people to think hard about the consequences of the uh, warming the lower stratosphere so that you might want to have particles that weren't so absorptive. Okay. Well, that's good. I mean, you yeah. mentioned the diamonds last night in the panel. Yeah. And I think it's a word that's easily digestible by someone outside. Well, so, of the so diamond is one of a handful of things. I mean, so, so, so you know, if you just do some kind of quick screen, you want things that are earth abundant, that have a highness refraction, and that are infrared uh, transmissive, don't, don't absorb, and that, um, you know, seem to have good biological, you know, ha ha a limited toxicity. And so there are actually a bunch of papers on nano diamond toxicity, and they suggest that it's very low and very safe. I, I'm not an expert, I haven't read it carefully, but at least like sort of the first order you know, it, it passes that screen, where lots of things wouldn't, right? Like if you found that, you know, some heavy metal was a good geohearing compound, you obviously would not even think about it because of the health impact. So, yeah. so the reasons to think that, that, that for example, diamond uh, might be good in that regard, but the question is, can you manufacture half micron diamonds at a reasonable price? I really have no idea. So after, 10 years of the kind of ramp that I was talking about, you'd want uh, 10,000 10, tons a year or some number about like that. Okay. Tens of thousands. That seems quite small. Yeah, well, well they're pretty efficient scatterers. Yeah, yeah maybe it's 20. I haven't done the math in my head. It depends on how quick the ramp is. I was expecting you to yeah. say something in the millions as opposed to the thousands. No, no. I mean, uh, 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 we're getting about um, half a watt per square meter for a milli globally for a million tons a year. So in the millions would be you know, several, more than a watt per square meter. I don't think we want to do that right away. I mean, the delivery method would be figured out by you know, a bunch of engineers who sharpened their pencils and did the work. And from what I, you know, from the study that we did, it looks to me like aircraft are you know, substantially Pardon? It's a proposal. One, one option could be... I think we're a long way from even making... I mean, proposal to whom? We're, we're doing science, and we're doing engineering, and we're thinking about ways that we could uh, uh, reduce climate risks. Uh, but I'm not... I mean, if hybrid airships end up being cheaper, fine. I, I, I don't... Yeah, but delivery is very important in terms of... No, I think delivery is really an easy part of the problem. I think really? all the hard problems here are social. And, and the other problems are environmental. No, the e delivery is probably the easiest and least interesting part of the entire problem. I mean, we, we, I mean, we just went to a regular commercial aircraft manufacturer. It's no big mystery. And, uh, 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 you know, getting uh, materials to the lower, uh, uh, even the lower tropical stratosphere is, you know, of order dollar a kilo kind of cost. And that means that even if you were going to do millions of tons of materials, you're talking, you know, billions, a few billion a year, and yeah. that's tiny compared to other costs involved in climate change. So it, it says to you that, me that cost is just, cost of delivery is not that big a deal here. But the point is, if you go to a regular commercial aircraft manufacturer and you ask about sort of what they think is commercial off the shelf, things that are sm not, not pressing the envelope, getting up to 23 or so kilometers is, you know, essentially, something that looks a bit like a re-engine business jet does it. Yes. And, and I don't think that's a particularly controversial fact. If you want to go significantly higher in crews, then there's new engine development. And there are certainly lots of ways you could do that, but that gets to be a billion dollar proposition with some technical risk. Okay. But if you're talking just the sort of 20, 20 kilometers, let's say, uh, then there are really no question. I mean, there have been, I mean, 
there have been a bunch of developments. Each one of, I mean, here's a sign that it's not that hard. There's been a series of aircraft developments recently for high altitude aircraft that have all done it more or less with off the shelf components, and they've all, all the ones that have tried to succeed it. I felt that the, the UK government did a wonderful job trying to open up and try and stick its nose out and, 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 and allow an experiment and talk about it. But I actually think that the, uh, from what I know about the, the, the stage gate process and the whole sandbox that produced it, they really produced essentially a terrible outcome because the very last problem we seem to have with solar geoengineering is it's too expensive. And so the idea of the first major engineering project that has an outdoor thing would be designed to make it still cheaper I thought was sort of deeply misguided. And, and it, it, much more sensible would be to work on things that reduce the risk or improve the efficacy. And, and by having the very first thing that they were going to focus on be cheaper deployment hardware, I thought yeah. was a, a really very poor choice of, of the Basically. British scientific community. More than unnecessary, sending profoundly the wrong message uh, uh, to their detriment. So I think it's really too bad it happened. And you know, I, I, I mean, I think the actual people doing it are totally well intentioned, and the, the science involved in these tethers or engineering is really fun, but it's really hard to see that it's relevant to this problem. I, I, the thermostat is not, I mean, they're, they're, I think that's not that helpful analogy. For one thing, there may be multiple thermostats in the sense that there's multiple. You know, climate's a many dimensional thing, it's not just temperature, and it's not clear that there's a single entity that would be doing the controlling. Uh, and, and then, unlike a thermostat where control is easy, in this case, control is much harder and inherently more noisy and uncertain. Uh, for most of stratospheric things, it's a year or two. So, okay, that's your committed group. I've ordered that. Well, no, th this is this issue of what's called termination. So if, if you've ramped it up a long way, I think what you're committed to do is to balance. If, if for some reason, one decides to stop, then you've got risks of the unmasked warming as you stop. And so you presumably want to ramp down in some more orderly way. Okay. I, I think it's absolutely I, vital. If you're going to have, I mean, the only way to make any kind of sensible public decisions about this are to have the discussion must be broad, broad both in both both in terms of the 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 sorts of people involved, their backgrounds, but also broad in terms of, of uh, broadening the topic because you, you can't make sensible decisions about solar geoengineering just talking about solar geoengineering by it, it is intimately connected with questions about the other ways we might respond to climate and more broadly with big questions about yeah, how we conceive of living on this planet and shaping it or being shaped by it over the next century. So you have to have those big conversations or you won't get to any kind of uh, crude consensus about what might be the right thing to do. Oh, just that if you do SRM, you, uh, uh, the world ends up releasing less CO2, say, from the ocean than it otherwise would have. That's all. Is it just, just ocean? Or? No, not just ocean. Land surface, too, and there's other effects. But yeah. These, yeah. these studies have been done. No. Nobody's done no, that. No, I mean, in sort of, is there, are there papers on this? Or? N no. It shows you some of the taboos involved in this field. Yeah, I, I, I would, I mean, for geoengineering, I advocate very serious research. And if the research bears out what now appears to be uh, uh, the facts about yeah. the potential benefits and the relative smallness of the risks, then I would support, under those conditions, some kind of slow ramp deployment of the kind we've written about, yes.